Welcome to Study Isaiah, the podcast where we examine the language, context, and meaning of the book of Isaiah with Dr. Paul Wegner. I'm Tyler Sanders, and with me is Dr. Wegner, who's going to tell us the Hebrew word of the day. Well, and actually, it's more of a phrase The today. Hebrew fruit yeah. phrase of the day. Yeah. It's Yom Yahweh. Yom the, Yahweh. The day of the Lord. Day of the Lord. And why that's so important is because we're in a the part you know that has the oracles to the nations, and, it, and usually the day of the Lord is a day of judgment on the wicked. Okay. In fact, that's that's kind of how it starts. It's a it's a phrase that means judgment on the wicked. Later on, they find out that even in Israel, there's going to be judgment on them. So as it progresses through the well, the Bible, you know, because it it adds more revelation as it goes along, huh. then you find out that even Israel one of these days is going to have it's a day a of day. reckoning. Yeah, Yom yeah. Yahweh. Yeah, and this is going to come up early for us yeah. in our new section. Yep, look at verse 6 says, yeah. Wail for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Well, that makes it pretty clear. Yeah. <laughs> Wail, destruction. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. You better get ready. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and chapter 13 is where we're starting. Yeah, should we look at our big picture again? Yeah, let's talk about the big picture, because this is a new section for It us. is, yeah. Do you remember it has three introductions, right? Yeah. Um, each one. Uh, if you look at 13.1, you'll see the new introduction. Mm -hmm. It says, the oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. Mm -hmm. So they all had that phrase, the son of Amos saw, or, yeah. or something like that. Yeah. So um, here's... here's now. Maybe not everybody agrees with this, but there was some... The structure here popped out at me after I thought about it a while. You've got you've got what I call a palistrophe. We're back okay. to the palistrophe. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> I figure out you see them everywhere, right? Uh, all right. But what I came across is I was wondering, why why would the oracles to the nations, why would they be parallel to Isaiah uh, narratives? Yeah. And why was there two things talking about the future, like the little apocalypse in chapters 24 through 27. Okay. And then you've got another one in uh, 35 through 30, or 34 and 35, mm -hmm. which once again talks about the future time period. Okay. And I thought, well, that seems weird. Why wouldn't they all be together? Yeah. And then in the middle, there's this, uh, you've got woe or oracles or judgment oracles, and then restoration oh. followed back and forth. There's seven of them, and they go back and forth between both of them. So I thought, man, that's okay. that when middle saying, part's at least interesting. When you're saying back and forth, like if it's if you can't see it, if you're just listening or something okay. like that, it, this is kind of like there's a woe oracle followed immediately by, by a restoration. Yes. And that happens like, well, it's eight, eight or nine Seven. times. Seven times, kind times. of in here, seven times. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, oh wait, yeah, uh, yeah, seven. Yeah, no, um, eight. Sorry. One, two, three, four. Yeah. yeah, it looks like there's eight. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, because that, that's a little, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Twist on it, really. Well, you and, know? and I think I saw that first. Then I started mm. wondering why do you have future time periods on both on either sides, sides of, of that? that? And then I came across the Oracles of the Nation. There's one of them that we're going to talk about later today mm -hmm. in chapter 14. Okay. That's to Assyria. Yeah. Now remember, Assyria is their enemy at that time of right. Isaiah, right? So, right. so, and and it's like four verses. It's very short. Yeah. And so you're wondering, well, why is that? But when you look at it, it's kind of like the most important verses in the oh. in the oracle because okay. because it says that this is the plan God did against the whole world. So he's he's oh. saying, I've done this against Assyria, but this is the plan for all of them that go against right. me. So, right. so I think what it is, is it's a, kind of the key to the oracles to the nations, uh -huh. and then the Isaiah narrative, uh, narratives explain what God did to Assyria. So oh, that's how they kind I of see. fit. So, so there's when, a big connection in the oracles to the nations, yes. specifically the oracle to Assyria, Assyria yep. with... Uh, uh, the Isaianic, Isaianic, Isaianic yeah. narratives. <laughs> yeah. That's in thirty six, thirty nine, which really yeah. is getting to the. That's the end of our yeah, yeah structure, right? The palestrophe. Yeah, uh, this big one that goes thirteen to thirty nine, and you're seeing yeah. kind of an Assyria connection. Yeah, yeah and, and the reason I saw it is because it it says this is the plan that I have against the mm -hmm. whole world. Yeah. So so that makes it pretty clear that what I did to Assyria. If you guys go against me, mm -hmm. I'm going to do to you. And then to see what it is, you can go to the 36 or 39, You'll see and it. it's real clear what the, he did to him. Right. So, right. so I think I think that's the connection. Yeah. Okay. So, and today we're covering just the oracles to the nations. Yes. Which is probably ha almost half of. <laughs> yeah. But it, but it's it's huge. Yeah. 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 But it's um. It, 
which tells you how we're going to have to do it. Yeah. I'm going to, we're going to have to. So what I've done is I made PowerPoints for each of the oracles. Uh -huh. So we'll be able to go through and say, oh, this one's to, to this country or nation. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in one sense, there's a lot of similarities. Um, there's almost a, there's a judgment for each one of them. Uh -huh. Usually it explains the reason. And usually the reason is that this country has done something against Israel uh -huh. or his people. Yeah. And therefore there's a restitution that has to be done. Right. So, right. so that's kind of, and and there's even some unique things in there. I will get to them, but there's I noticed a lot stuff. of interesting. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, I having you know spoken to you before time, I kind of assumed they would maybe line up even more. Yeah. Um, or structurally, they maybe even kind of. I, I assume they may follow a similar structure, but they're very. There's a lot of variety there. There's a lot of yeah. um, very specific figurative language yes. that doesn't necessarily. Repeat. It's kind of there's unique yeah. things about each yeah. uh, each country. That uh, it was fascinating to read. Yeah, and if you know the history, probably it makes even more sense. Mm. Some of them are so figurative; it's hard to know exactly what they're getting at. Yeah, but some of them are real clear. It's clear. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. And, and some of them we know just because of the history, like Babylon. We know what they did. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. So that's kind of what we're looking at now. And Babylon is our first. Yes. Oracle, correct? Yeah. So why don't we go to it? Let's get into it. All right. Um, I've, I've got a map up here because I know now that every time I teach Sunday school... That's helpful. Most people have no idea where Babylon is and yeah. what it is. Yeah. So it was it was the, basically the second empire. The mm -hmm. first empire... Let me explain that first. Um, first of all, there's countries... Mm -hmm. And then, so so when, it, well, first of all, they're what we call city states. Yeah, that's that's where a, a city like like Babylon, okay, yeah. becomes so big that it starts taking over neighboring, na yeah, areas, villages and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So um, things like even Jerusalem at some point is like more like a city state because it's mm. controlling areas uh, that in Samaria, it's yeah. it's a, a huge thing, but it's growing. Um, I'm trying to. Th I think Damascus is probably our best example of one because um, it actually it, Damascus never. You, you hear more about Damascus in these oracles than you do Syria. Well, sure, Syria is the country. So why it doesn't it mention the country where all these other most of a lot a lot of these other ones mention the country? Yeah. And I think the answer is because it was a city state long before it was a country. Yeah. And anyway, as it grows, then it takes in this other land so that it becomes a country. Then in time, it starts taking different countries. Yeah. It becomes an empire, and they just continue to grow. Um, the first one was Assyria, right? And we, we don't have a picture of that yet, but later we will. Um, but but as it as it grew, it um, Assyria to, had part of this area. Then Babylon took over what it controlled, plus what Assyria, plus Assyria. controlled. Then yeah. Persia took over what it controlled, and everything that the Babylonians and the Assyrians right. controlled. So it just kept right. getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. So that'll help us some when we get into it. I think. Yeah, I think so. Um, and you know, like you said earlier, like really before this, the focus has been on Assyria. Yeah. Uh, so why is Babylon coming in? Why do you think Babylon is the first oracle uh, here? Uh, now, remember, we're in another section, so probably what happened is that these were separate oracles mm. against the nations that at some point were just pulled together. I think the reason Babylon is at the beginning is because it also ends the the Palestorf. Remember, mm. um, in the almost the very last verse, uh, he says that, one of these days, they're going to be taken off into Babylon. Okay. So it kind of starts this big palistrophe. It also yeah. ends this big palistrophe. Okay. So I think maybe that's the best reason yeah. of all. Um, Babylon is one of the bigger ones, too. So mm. that could yeah, also be... Yeah, I did be. notice that, yeah. And, and probably it's because God's got some real judgment on it, because they're, they were the ones that deported their yeah. people, or you know, Judah, at least. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, well, let's get into the text. <laughs> all right. Okay, what I did is I tried to find certain sections that we could read, and then that'll tell us. So we won't cover everything, but we'll cover pretty much the verses we've got here. And mm -hmm. I figured by seeing these verses, it'll give you a picture of everything else. Yeah. Okay? Now, if there's things that I miss, you can bring them up, and I'll try to explain them. Okay? I'll tell you everything. You yeah, yeah, that's right. yeah, 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 that's right. That's right. <laughs> okay, so let's start at verse 6 in chapter 13. Yeah, which is our Hebrew word of the day verse. That's right, yeah. So wail for the day of the Lord is near; it will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, therefore, all the hand, all hands will be limp, and every man's heart will melt. They will be terrified 
uh, pains and anguish will uh, take hold of them. They will ride like a woman in, ch- in labor. They will also look at one another in astonishment. Their face is aflame. I, I think, uh, you know, when a f- uh, face turns red, so that, I think that's what it's getting at when it says its face is uh, yeah. aflamed. Yeah. Okay. Um, behold, the day of the Lord is, Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation. He will exterminate it, its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark and it, uh, when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Part of the reason I went that far, I'm, I'm still mm-hmm. going to a few more verses, but part of the reason I went that far is notice it's connecting these with like f- what sounds like futuristic mm-hmm. um, elements, like the sun's going to turn black and those kind of things. Yeah. So it's it's actually mentioning those even now. So I'm actually believing that at the end time, it's picking up these images that were already wow. in the future, you know, already in the past that they knew about. Yeah. Uh, so, and we know something like that would be a real destruction on a country, right? So, yeah. so it's when it, it does that, it's given us a picture of it with symbolic language. Okay. Okay. I see. Yeah. So, so then when Revelation or something like that picks it up, yeah. the images were already there. They just used I see what them you're saying. again. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right, um, verse eleven. Thus, it will punish the world. Uh, I will punish the world for its evil and the wickedness of their iniquity, and I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud. So, he's now uh, not only giving you that he's going to destroy Babylon, and here it even talks about the world, the wicked. So it's uh, you know the world and it's for its evil. Mm. So it's 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 connecting it now with not only Babylon, but even further the judgment that at some point he's going to pour out. We'll see that further when we get to the little apocalypse, but it's it's already got little images yeah. here as we go along. Yeah. Okay. And do you remember when we were in chapter two, it talked about the uh, the loftiness of man. He's going to bring down oh, yeah. all yeah. the high trees. He's going to yeah, cut down. Right, right. And, and basically it was because of their pride. Yeah. Well, it's coming back here and you can see right, that. Right, right. Okay. All right, I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud the, and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. I will make, make mortal men scarcer than pure gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. So he's basically saying there's not going to be hardly any left after yeah. this big destruction. Yeah. Okay. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken from its place at the, at the fury of the Lord of hosts in the day of its burning, his burning anger. And it will be like a hunted gazelle or like a sheep that none can gather them. And they will turn to its own people and each one will flee to their own land. That's probably enough. I, I, oh, no, I wanted to get to verse 16. Um, look at verse 16. Their little ones will also be dashed to pieces before yeah. their eyes. Their houses will be plundered and their wives ravaged. Now, that is intentional because if we go back to Psalm 139, mm. it says that Babylon did that to Israel. And so this oh. is actually a restitution for what Babylon did to them. Yeah. Now they're going to get it back. Yeah. So, so that's why I want to make sure you saw 16, because that is crucial yeah, to the... Why is, why is God punishing them? Well, right. there's a really good reason, and it's going to be pretty thorough, and it's going yeah. to be pretty thorough because of what they did. Yeah. Does it make sense? And this is kind of a balancing yeah. kind of idea of justice in a yeah. way. Yeah, where God is pouring out what they did back on their heads, yeah. basically. Yeah. You know. Uh, God, it's, it's interesting. God often does that. Um, throughout Scripture, you'll often have that this they did, and so this is the consequence of what mm-hmm. they did. And, and they're often connected. Like, um, they starved people, so they're going to starve. Yeah. Or they, um, they were real cruel to people, so they're going to have cruelness done to them. So there's often that retribution kind of yeah. punishment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's the first section. Mm-hmm. Then... It goes into more specifics. Now, um, if we didn't know this was an oracle to Babylon, this first part is so general, it would have been hard to know that. But when we get to verse 17, it starts getting more specific. Look what it says. Behold, I'm going to stir uh, up the Medes against them and those who um, will not value silver or take pleasure in gold. So the Medes were the ones that that actually... um, Conquer, you know, the Medes and the Persians, yeah, them together. Oh, yeah, yeah, took yeah. the Babylonians, yeah. So, so at this point, he's actually given us a little hint who it's going to be. Now, remember, this oracle has to be way before the Babylonians were around because remember, Isaiah's in the 700s, Babylon doesn't 
come and take them until more like the 600s. Yeah. So, so this is a future him telling them what's going to happen and that he's going to punish them for it. Yeah. So, so it's kind of neat. neat. You've got this oracle judgment, but it's also in the future for them. Right. They, they wouldn't have known this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, it's it's telling when it says who will not take uh, value, uh, who will not value silver or take pleasure in gold. That probably means you can't buy them off. Yeah. So they're going to come and judge you no matter what you do. You can't. Yeah. You can't get away from it. Right. Okay. Um, their bows will mow down uh, down the young men, and they will not even have compassion on the fruit of the womb, nor have their eye have pity on children. And Babylon, the beauty of the kingdoms, the glory of the uh, uh, Chaldeans' pride will will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation, nor will the Arab pitch its tent there, nor will flocks uh, will shepherds take their flocks and lie down there, but desert creatures will lie down there. So that gives you some clue about how bad it's going to yeah, be. It's completely be, desolate. Really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, uh, yeah, look at verse 20. It will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation. So that's telling you, this is going to be a constant thing. And if you mm -hmm. go to Babylon today, you can actually see the ruins. They're still there. Right. You know? yeah. so, so this, in, in Isaiah's time, this was a prophecy about what was going to happen to Babylon. And now they actually can see that it actually took place yeah. very accurately. Yeah, yeah. So, so I thought that's kind of neat. So oh, that, yeah, yeah. That's, that gives you some flavor of what these oracles to the nations are like. Yeah. Okay? These are elements that will appear in... Yeah, over and over again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, now I want to show you the next... So you've got two chapters, 13 and 14. Mm -hmm. Well, 14 is like, he's got this like, it begins like with this interlude um, saying, okay, Babylon's going to be destroyed, but my people are going to come back stronger than ever. You know, so, so mm. look at verse 3. And it will be in the day when the Lord gives you rest from the pain and, tor and, and turmoil and harsh service in which you have been enslaved. Now remember, this is Isaiah's time. They yeah. wouldn't have known that. Right. You know, so we're in the 700s. He's talking about the 600s. Yeah. Okay? So, so he's letting them know, you guys are going to have a little problem here, okay? Uh, that you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon and say... So, so it's like a, a song of... Judgment almost like yeah. yeah taunt is when you're kind of um, oh wait wait uh, when your head maybe pick, yeah you're picking on somebody yeah, and, you're winning you're yeah <laughs> making fun of the loser kinda. yeah 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 there you go okay so so I, I need to I'm gonna read a pretty good section of this because I want you to see it goes into a part that I know you're real familiar with okay so I need to I need to have you see the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So how the oppressor has ceased. So that means the oppressor is probably Babylon. And now we see. So that means he's been destroyed. Yeah. Okay. And how his fury has ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers, which used to strike the people in fury with unceasing strokes. That that probably means they went way over what they needed to do. Yeah. So they were cruel, it sounds like. Yeah. Okay. Which subdued the nations in anger with un restrained persecution. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth with shouts of joy. Even the cypress trees rejoice over you and the cedars of Lebanon saying, now I, got, I need to let you know that. That's actually kind of neat because one of the reasons the Assyrians and the Babylonians took the land of, ba of Lebanon was mm. they wanted to cut down their trees. Yeah. So it's saying, well, yeah. now nobody's coming after That's us anymore. Right, yeah. So even yeah. the trees are happy that yeah. Babylon's been destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Since you were laid low, no tree cutter has come up against us. Mm. So see, that makes sense. Yeah. The Persians didn't really care about that, apparently. Yeah. They, their empire was so big, they could probably get uh, wood else. from everywhere, yeah, yeah. everywhere else. Okay. Now, look at Sheol from beneath is excited over you to meet you when you come. It rouses for you the spirits of the dead and the leaders of the earth. It raises all the kings of the nations from their throne. They will respond and say to you, even you have been made like uh, weak as, as we. You have become like us. Your pomp and the music of your harps have been brought down to Sheol. Maggots are spread out and your bed beneath you and worms are your covering. So they're cheering 
that Babylon's been destroyed because that Babylon was the one that came and destroyed all yeah. of them. Yeah. So he says they're they're ecstatic because now he's got he's as weak as they are. They're right. He's being eat up by worms just like happened yeah. to them. Yeah. So this so it's now remember it's figurative. Yeah. But it, but it really makes sense. It, it, all of these you know these people certainly would have hated Babylon for destroying them. Yeah. And it's saying, well, don't worry, they're going to get their time to to make yeah. fun of you now. Yeah, yeah. So, do you see that figurative language and all that? But it, yeah, but it, sure. But it's telling yeah. us something. It's telling us what it was like. And well, yeah, because really, like, I mean, when I read that, it seemed to me it was like the dead are saying this. Yeah. essentially, like the yeah. dead, the kings, of, you know, and the rulers that you defeated are all kind of like, yep. that's right. That's now exactly you're going to be right. just like us. Yeah, which of course, you know, we would say is yeah. Yeah, that that'd be figurative, but it it totally makes sense. It's a good image, I think, to explain, I think so. you yeah. know, where where the, he's going to end up, you know, or yeah. where Babylon's going to end up. Okay, now it's going to go. Okay, so it's already done that. Now the next couple of verses are going to explain it, I think, even further. Mm. But it's going to use language that's even more hyperbolic and figurative and stuff like that. Okay. So look what it says: How have you fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn? Now, before I go any more, <laughs> I've got to let you know. Yeah. It was the, the Latin Vulgate that translated that star of the morning as Lucifer. So if I ask you what's Satan's name, yeah, right, right. you're going to tell me Lucifer, right? Sure. Well, here's where it comes from. Yeah. And I, I'm not convinced this is talking about Lucifer. I, yeah. I think uh, Star of the Morning probably was Venus. Um, mm. It was known as a star that would climb in the morning and then would appear to tumble down because it, it didn't have the orbit that went made it go circular all the way around. Yeah. It would actually more start kind of turning. Cut off or whatever. Yeah, so it would look like it was falling to the earth instead, mm. of, instead of continuing a round circuit. Does that make sense? Am yeah, I yeah. clear there? Yeah, um, what, what the people would have seen. Yeah, uh, and, and remember it. the Babylonians, their whole they, they were stargazers, so they were mm -hmm. astrologists and stuff like that. So they studied the stars, so they would have been aware of that. So, so the the term "star of the morning" was probably going to be really familiar to them. They would know. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's Venus, and that's a the planet that that looks like it tumbles to the earth. Yeah. So it would make sense. All right. So how have you fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn? You've been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to the, he the heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. So the question, you've probably heard the five I wills of Satan, right. and they get them from this passage. Yeah. I think it's still talking about king of Babylon. Yeah, it seems like that. It's it, it, if you read it in context. Now, if you take it out of context, you could see how it would apply to yeah. Satan. But I think it's supposed to. It's figurative to understand who the king, uh, the boastfulness of the king of Babylon. Remember, it's already told us about how arrogant and proud they are. Yeah. And and then he's going to be brought low. And you know this for sure, right? Uh, we see Daniel and remember uh, right, uh, right. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar yeah. when he's standing on the uh, top of Babylon and he yeah. says, "Is this not?" Mighty Babylon, which I have made, yeah. and God, God stops him and makes yeah. him an animal. Right. So my understanding is that they they would have had that concept, or they soon they remember not at the time they would have, but later on when they saw these things happening and saw what Scripture said about it, I think it would make sense to them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now I need to give you this too. Hmm. I'm convinced that any real, real wicked person is also a picture of Satan. Right, mm. so if you want to say, "Oh, it's a wicked person," it's a picture of Satan. I'll give you that because that's that's true all the time. Yeah, but I don't think this biblical text is actually referring to Satan. I think what it's doing is it's talking about the king of Babylon, but just showing how wicked people are very characteristic of Satan too. Right, and and that makes right. sense. I mean, the the greater the wickedness, the more they look like Satan. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> yeah, I would think that's <clears throat> normal almost. All right. Um, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will raise my throne above the stars of God, I will sit in the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. See, for them, the recesses of the north are where their gods dwelled. Hmm. So they, the, the north is the word Safan, and they had something called Mount Safan where they thought the gods dwelt, and it had snow capped. So mm -hmm. they thought, oh, this is really special, that the gods must dwell up there. Yeah. Well, that, that's why I think this truly would make sense to them. You know, that's where they thought the gods dwelled, so that's where this guy's falling from. Yeah. Okay? I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. 
So that's the boastfulness. Do you remember the Assyrian in uh, um, the chapter uh, chapter ten where he talks about oh and and you know and, and I plucked up all the gold and all that just like like a um, a person gathers eggs from a chicken right. and none of them pluck you know flap their wings or even clucked yeah, against yeah, yeah. me yeah. and he's saying. This is another picture of a, a wicked person, another wicked king, yeah. acting the same way. Yeah. Now, here's my evidence for what I'm telling you. Look at the next verse. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol in the recesses of the pit. Now, you could say, oh, well, Satan is going to be cast down to Sheol. Mm. But then look at the next verse. Those who gaze at you, will, uh, those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble? Yeah. Well, it just That's told us specific. who. Yeah, it just told yeah. us who it was. Yeah. So unless you take that section out and apply it to somebody else, I think in context it makes perfect sense. Yeah. That it's talking about the king of Babylon. Yeah. Now I'll give you the king of Babylon is wicked like Satan is, and so right. he's a picture of him, and that makes sense. Yeah. But the text itself says it's a man. Well, and it, I mean, like what we've seen a lot, and we're going to see is like there's a lot of like. Figurative language is going to use things that you are aware of and you know, and like yeah. there, there may even be an argument to be made that like you understand things of a spiritual nature, like Lucifer or God, you know, yeah. by seeing how they're compared to yeah. men. You know, yeah. this could help us kind of understand who Lucifer is, but okay. main ma- is not a direct reference. Yeah, yeah, to him. You yeah. know. In, in the same sense as uh, any wicked person is like yeah. Satan, these things would fit for him too. Yeah. And I think what's interesting is I, I always want people to be really careful because some people will say, oh, it's so figurative, you can't understand it. Well, that's not really true. Mm. I've always argued that figure speech is, or, you know, figure speech, whatever they are, are set in at least in a little reality so that they understand yeah. it. it my, my classic example is that when, when, I, when I say, um, eat my dust, like, like what, if, I, if I tell you we're going to have a race and you're going to be eating my dust, you know what that means. It means yeah. that I'm going to be ahead of you and you're kicking up dust. Yeah. All right. But actually there's a very literal thing about that too, right? If mm-hmm. I was that far ahead of you kicking up dust, you will be eating my dust. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's that, that figure of speech has a core of, of real truth in it. Yeah. And I would actually argue that these have a very literal thing behind them yeah. that gave rise to those figures of speech. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what I think is happening. Yeah, that makes sense to okay. me. Okay, yeah. good. Um, that, so my real key was verse 16, yeah. where it says, is this the man who made the earth tremble? Yeah. Okay, does chapter 13 and 14 make sense? This is an yeah. oracle against Babylon. Yeah. It's it's talking a lot about the judgment that's God done as mm-hmm. gonna do to them. Mm-hmm. A lot of it is because that they treated Israel very poorly, so that they're gonna have their uh, little ones dashed to pieces and, yeah. and that. So that phrase there is the same one you get in the, the psalm. psalm that yeah. says this what the Babylonians did. Yeah. So it's 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 really, in my mind, kind of a clear picture of what God's going to do, and a lot of things. Now, there's a whole lot more in there, I agree. Right? Yeah, yeah. But I, just want, I thought if you got the core, it would make some sense. Then. Yeah, of course, yeah. All right. So what's our next one? Okay. Next one is in 14 as well, right? Yes, and it's the Syria. This is in my mind. Yeah. Notice I put there the most important one. Yeah. And, I, and, and it's a few verses. Oh, the, first of all, let me tell you, uh, can you see verse 28? It says, in mm-hmm. the year that King Ahaz died, the, the oracle came. Yeah. Um, some people aren't, aren't sure whether that goes with the Assyrian oracle. Or the following one. Or the following one. I'm going to argue it's almost always uh, titles like that are at the at beginning of a book, Never, mm-hmm. I, I, or a, some, a beginning of an a oracle. section, yeah. Hardly ever is it at the end. I've never, in fact, I've never seen one at the end. Yeah. So I think this one has to be connected to the next one, and actually there it, it makes some sense with the next mm. one. So I'll show you why I okay. think it's there. But that means, so from verses 24, to 27. That's really all that's, we get on Assyria. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, let's look and see where it is. So yeah. that's that's basically the uh or you know the uh empire. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, now this is throughout the whole uh because they they didn't conquer Egypt until like Ashurbanipal, uh, which is one of the later Assyrian kings. So it's it's it, this was a building process and they kept getting more and more as the as they went along. Okay. So Babylon is even included in that. Yes. Wow. Yeah. And, and a lot of times Assyria and Babylon fought even before Babylon yeah. was even an empire yeah. because because Babylon 
hated being ruled by the sure. Assyrians. So, yeah. so it, probably some of the the fiercest fighting for Assyria was against Babylon. Wow! Even before Babylon was an empire. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, now this one we got to read all of it because it's so crucial. Well, it'll be easy because this is very short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. All right. The Lord of Hosts has sworn, saying, "Oh, I once did a um, dis- uh, a thesis when I was <laughs> in, uh, doing my THM on when God swears, mm. and when God swears, sometimes there's in the context he'll use like he swears by his mighty arm or something mm. like that. So it's it's got something to do with what's crucial about this t- this passage. But here, where he's swearing, he's letting you know this is really going to happen. You might not believe it, mm. but it's going to. Now remember." For Assyria at this time and in, in Isaiah's time, he knows that they're growing and he knows that they're a powerful nation and he's had a lot of interactions with them already. Yeah. They, ha- they took the northern kingdom already away. All right. Okay. So so if in, and in 701, he's going to come down on, on Judah. Yeah. So Isaiah knows that, in fact, a lot of that history he already is aware of. Yeah. So when it says, um, the Lord of hosts has sworn saying, um, my guess is it's because he needs to make it really strong. You better believe this. Yeah. You may not believe it at this point, but it's true. Yeah. Okay? So look what he says. Surely, just as I have intended, so it, was, it has happened. And notice it says, it has happened. Yeah. That's past tense. Yeah. So this was recorded after... Oh, hang on. I'll just tell you when it has to be after. All right? And just as I have planned, so it will stand. To break Assyria in my land, and I will trample him on my mountains, and then the yoke will be removed from from them, and his burden from upon their shoulders, um, and this will be the plan devised against the whole earth. So, my understanding here, it's past tense. It's after seven o one when God punished them and took, broke the yoke off their shoulder and all that. Yeah. So that this actually, he can say, just like it happened to them. So it will happen to the rest of them. So notice, yeah. this is the plan devised against the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out against all the nations. Oh, that stretched out. I know. I yeah. noticed that. I was like, oh, I'll yeah, stretched hand, the uplifted hand. We're yeah. back. Yeah. Okay, against all the nations, for the Lord of Hosts has planned, and who can frustrate it? For He has stretched out His hand, did it again. Who yeah. can t- turn it back? Yeah. So do you see? He's, that's why I think this one is the most important oracle of all of them, because he's yeah. saying not only that Assyria is going to be punished, but just like Assyria was punished, so are the rest of you guys going to be Yeah. if you come against me. Yeah. Okay? So that's that's my what I think is one of the most important ones. Yeah. And, and I, think, I think it's interesting that you can tell it's already past tense. It's already happened, yeah. so they can actually see what's going on. Remember... I, oh, go ahead. Well, I thought... I, I picked up on the outstretched... Yeah, hand thing, which I thought was really interesting, but I yeah. feel like this part really it helps make sense out of that that kind of figure of speech. I think too, because when it says sentence, "who can frustrate it" and "who can turn it back," yeah, you know, it's ready, yeah, to strike, and only he could choose to, yeah, to relent that. Yeah, I think I think this is a kind of a helpful background. Now I was just going to say. Now remember. These are probably not in chronological order. Yeah. So these oracles were given throughout Isaiah's lifetime. Remember, he's prophesied for 60 years. Right. So, so there's probably a good long time that yeah. these oracles could have been around there. But it's also stuff... Now, now remember on the Babylon, that was in the future. Yeah. The one on Assyria seems like it's already it's past. past. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's helpful. Yeah. That's why knowing that history we talked about at the beginning, I think is crucial mm-hmm. for... These, yeah, to see where things parts. fit in. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Okay? All right, so that's the Assyrians. Yep. Okay? Um, here's, I'm just summarizing. So uh, 24, mm. so it has happened. This is a plan devised against the whole earth, and the Lord has planned who can frustrate it. So in my mind, yeah. those are the kind of like the key things you got to remember about that one. Yeah. Okay? Philistia. All right? Here's here's uh, a picture of where Philistia is. Now, remember... Um, you can see where Lachish is. Jerusalem is just a little further off the map here. Okay. So that gives you some clue where um, yeah. the Philistines lived. Yeah. And and um, I don't know if you can see, but do you see those uh, ones that have bigger the dots around or the circles around circles? Yeah. Those are the Pentapolis. So Philistines had five cities. They didn't have just one major city. They oh. actually had five, and they all mm. worked together. 
So you had, yeah, Ekron, huh. Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gaza, and Gath were kind of like their major cities, and they all worked together. So I think you had to have agreement on, I'm not sure exactly how it worked, but my guess is you probably had to have agreement among the five before right. they could do something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a little different than our yeah. city-state. Yes. Idea we had. Yeah, earlier. because now you've got all of the. Yeah, this is this is kind of maybe. I'm not sure when the Pantapolis yeah. f- came around, but they would have been big cities. Yeah. But they didn't control as much as all of them together. So it's kind right. of interesting. It's a it's a little like that, but a little different too. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. And what what does the oracle against? Philistia. Okay. It's going to be judgment, yep. just like you expect. Yeah. But this one is actually interesting, and that's why I said that date actually helps us. Notice it says that this the is... The date in uh, 28. That, yeah, that Verse King 28. Ahaz dies. Mm-hmm. Okay, look at the next phrase. Do not rejoice, <clears throat> O Philistia, all of you, because the rod that struck you is broken. So the rod that struck him is probably Ahaz. Okay, now now you can go to this verse 29, because I I put in the words there so you know. Okay, do not rejoice, O Philistia, all of you, because the rod that struck you is broken. So that would be Mm -hmm. Ahaz. It just told you he died. Yeah. Okay? The rod that struck you is broken. Okay? For the serpent's... uh, For from the serpent's root, I think that Hezekiah, a viper will come. So so Ahaz's son is Hezekiah, Uh and from Hezekiah... A viper will come out, which is Sennacherib. Yeah. So it's not his offspring, but because Hezekiah rebelled against Sennacherib, they came against him in 701. Right. So I think that's what he's saying. So don't don't be so happy that Ahaz died because yeah. it's going to get even worse for you. Yeah. So the off, uh, the serpent's root is going to be a, uh, Hezekiah. He, from Hezekiah, a viper will come out from a different country, but even worse. Okay, <clears throat> and its fruit will be a flying serpent. Esarhaddon, who's even worse than Sennacherib. <laughs> so, so it, it's saying. So, so really, what it's saying is, don't don't be so excited because it's going to get worse for you. Yeah. And and it tells you uh, now. It's once again in figurative language, but yeah. it's kind of brilliant. If you, you can think about see it. it, yeah. Ahaz went against Philistia, and and you know they they hated him because he he punished him. Yeah. And now he, they're broken, but he's saying, don't be too excited yeah. because his son is going to give uh, is going to be a. a from the serpent's root, meaning Ahaz, yeah. Hezekiah is going to come out, yeah. and because of Hezekiah, a viper is going to come on you. Yeah. So it's, it, if you know the history, those those things make so much sense. Yeah. Well, so, and the, I think the <clears throat> images yeah. are still pretty sensible to you yeah. know. Uh, yeah. My assumption is a viper would be a uh, poisonous. Yes. So yeah. like that's worse than probably a serpent, or more at least more specific, maybe. Yeah, it's probably more specific. A kind because because from what I can tell, a nahash, uh, which is the word for serpent in Hebrew, usually means a poisonous serpent. Oh, okay. So if that's true, a viper is probably just more specific yeah. one. And and viper maybe they thought was even more um, uh, dangerous. You know, mm. um, like cobras and vipers and stuff like that are thought to be about the worst kind of snakes they would know. Right. Right. And then a flying serpent. Well, Uh, that sounds horrible. Yeah, 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 that's right. You already talked about it earlier that you really hate snakes. snakes, (laughs) If they can fly, I mean. (laughs) But that probably just talks about the speed of it. And Sir Haddon did, uh, came across and conquered people quite quickly, especially Egypt. Interesting. Flying, so flying could be a reference to speed. Yeah, a uh, moment. In Daniel, that happens also, the Language, oh uh, right, right, right. Yeah, with the shaggy coat. Right? Uh, yeah, he looks like he's flying because he's moving so fast. Yeah, and the leopard that has wings. Oh right, right, the right. Idea of the wings again would yeah. be for speed. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, now look at verse thirty-one. Okay, thirty-one. How then will will one answer the messengers of the nation that the Lord God has founded Zion and the afflicted of the people will seek refuge in it? So in the heart of Babylon, which they were the one that, I'm sorry, in Philistia, who had attacked Israel, Uh and they were now cheering that, you know... Yeah, the king's dead. Yeah, and and now we're going to be saved. Well, it's going to get worse for you, he says, and it's not going to get worse for Zion. In fact, Mm. one of these days is talking about people seeking refuge there. So the idea that even in... So so I, I did that. I wanted you to see that because even in the midst of some of these oracles to the nations, where like in Babylon, it talked about them being destroyed, but that when that happens, Israel is going to have a restoration. Yeah. Okay? So so 
a lot of times you'll have these little hints that even though this nation is going to be punished, don't worry, Israel's, Israel's still coming back. Have, yeah. 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 So I, I wanted you to see that because that uh, in That's my mind helps you understand. More. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now we've done the third one, which is Philistia. Now Moab. Now, Moab. Now, if if you think about it, so here's Israel, right? Right, kind of in the center. Okay. The Fli- Philistines on your side would be over here. They're in the west. Yeah. Moab would be down underneath. Oh, actually, on the east. Yeah. And then Edom will be underneath them. So, yeah. so these are all their their enemies yeah. around them. The neighboring. Yeah, and yeah. at different times, they were enemies. Uh, yeah. Not all the time, because a lot of times Moab was was taken over by Israel or you know mm. controlled by Israel. Yeah. But there were major times when they weren't, and yeah. so because of the punishment that they did to Israel, they're going to get their punishment right back. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. All right, so let's look at a couple things. So here's Moab, if you see it. It's on the east side of the Dead Sea. Okay, yep. Oh, I, don't, oh, I see Jude have and Have you ever heard of the no. King's Highway? Uh-uh. Okay. King's Highway is the major road that goes along the the, the mountaintops on that side of the of oh, the Dead Sea. Okay. So on the east side, you're going to have this major road. I think it's Highway One today, um, in in uh, Jordan. Yeah. And it's and it's it goes along the tops, but it was it's been a major road for ages. Wow. Okay. Even back then, the King's Highway was pretty much known about. Yeah. And and I believe why why they called it the King's Highway is because um, they would bring their riches. From uh, like from Edom or mm-hmm. from uh, the various countries, uh, it, it's, uh, Saudi Arabia and those, they would bring their riches up to um, the various countries up north, like Assyria or Babylon. Interesting. Yeah, looks like there's several cities right along. Yeah, yeah. Right well, that would the... make sense, right? Because they would yeah. want to trade with them if they right. could and supply food and water. Yeah, they ne- need that because it's a pretty dry country. Yeah, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, so what do we have to say about Moab? Okay, um, let's look at uh, verse 1, um, the oracle concerning Moab, and that's kind of how most of these start, right? The mm-hmm. oracle concerning a country, okay? Surely in a night, Ar uh, of Moab is devastated and ruined. Surely in a night, Ker of Moab is devastated and ruined. So it's telling us that major cities in, and I, I don't have them up yes. here because uh, oh, these are probably... One? Okay. Is it, are any of them there? Ker... Hereseth? Is that different? Oh, it could be. No, that, that could be correct. it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, usually what happens is they have uh, some term and then would explain it by the second word around mm. them. Um, uh, ear is often a, uh, a word they say. Ear in Hebrew means city. So uh, ear... City of here, something. Yeah. yeah. So... Okay. And then often gath, um, gath heifer and stuff like that. Mm. Gath means wa- uh, uh, wine press. Oh. And so it was a um, a wine press, you know. And so, yeah. so it would, you know, there's going to be wine presses all over the country. So they had to narrow it down. Well, which one is this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's a lot of times how cities were named. I think. Huh. Okay, so so it's saying two major cities are destroyed. Okay, devastated and ruined. Yeah, there you go. Pretty yeah, extensively. <laughs> So it gives you a real clue, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, they have gone up to the temple and to Dibon and to the high places to weep. Moab weeps over Nebo and and um, Medaba. So so basically, the high places; um, those are the places where the the uh, Baal or the false gods yeah. were worshipped. And notice, uh, Dibon was another major city. Mm-hmm. Medaba, another one. Every head is bald and every beard is cut off. So they'd, they'd be, uh, if they're bald, it's because they've been shaved yeah. uh, and every beard cut off. So that's usually suggesting humiliation. Yeah. I remember um, uh, David's servants that got, oh, right. uh, who to went to uh, the king of uh, Syria, I believe it was, when they came back, he cut off yeah. half their beard. But yeah. well, they were so embarrassed that he had them yeah. stay in Jericho yeah, until, until he grew, grew back, back up. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's that kind of thing. In their streets, they have uh, girded themselves with sackcloth, and their housetops in the squares, everyone is wailing, dissolved in tears. Well, that's probably enough. You can actually see what's going on. Mm. Their, their mourning, uh, devastation has come around. Yeah. So, so basically, um, the nation's been destroyed. Now look at verse 5. My heart cries out, O Moab, and fugitives are as far as Zor and um, um, Eliath, uh, Shalshaliah, uh, for the, they go up the ascent of Le, uh, Lutha, uh, weeping. Surely the road of Haron uh, raises a city of distress, or a cry of distress over their ruins. So basically, the fugitives are fleeing, and, and you remember Zor? 
uh, Zora is on this other side of the Dead Sea, uh, in about the, the western middle side? of there. Yeah, okay. the western side. Um, and so uh, that's the, the place where um, Lot wanted to flee to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and he said, oh, yeah. isn't that a little city? So they were fleeing to these places to get away from the destruction. Yeah. Okay, then verse 13 is kind of interesting. So this one, once again, has two chapters. Not all of them do, but Moab mm-hmm. is another one. But go to, go to verse 13, because this is interesting. Look what it says. This is a word which the Lord spoke earlier concerning Moab. So, so apparently the one before that was the, the later oracle, and this is one that was earlier. Oh. So Isaiah's put these two together, even yeah. though they're from different times. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Look at this one. Um, This is a word which the Lord spoke earlier concerning Moab. But now the Lord speaks, saying, Within three years, as a hired man would count them, the glory of Moab will be degraded among the great population, and its remnant will be very small and impotent. So basically, it's going to... He's already told them before that they're going to be destroyed, and now he's got another one to explain what's going on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me let me point out one more thing. Can you go back to verse sixteen, um, or chapter sixteen? I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, the beginning. Yeah, these yeah. Th- there's some things in here that I think will help us. Send a tribute lamb, or send a lamb to the ruler of the land from Sela by the way of the wilderness to the mountain of the daughter of Zion. Sela is usually thought to be Petra. So if mm. you because it's it, Sela means cliff. Okay. And Petra was a city in the cliffs, yeah. basically. Yeah. So, um, so Moab is sending a, a tribute lamb to Jerusalem. Okay. Mm. Uh, then, like fleeing birds or scattered n- nestlings, the daughter of Moab will be at the fords of the Arnon. Um, the Arnon River is right there. Um, it's it, Zared River is down at the bottom of the Dead Sea. Mm-hmm. The Arnon is up uh, about the middle. Halfway. Is, on and, the east and side. Notice that's the top of Moab. So they're fleeing over the Arnon oh, to I get see. to Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Um, now, look at verse 3. Give us advice. Make a decision. Cast your shadow like, like night at high noon. Hide the outcasts. Do not betray the fugitives. So apparently this is talking to Israel to not harm those fleeing from Moab. Yeah. Part of the logic is, remember, Moab was uh, a relative to Israel. Yeah. Edom and Moab are, you remember, the different uh, brothers uh, that were related to yeah, yeah. Uh, Jacob, I believe it was. But but these countries were were part of them. That, that, and, and so because they're relatives, Israel's not to harm them. Yeah. And so that's what that's getting at. Let the outcasts of Moab stay with you. Be a hiding place to them from the destroyer. For the extortioner has come to an end. Destruction has ceased. Oppressors have completely been disappointed. So, so he's saying, now be kind to these the, to Moab. They're your relatives because they're being d- destroyed by the destroyer. But now look at verse 5. A throne will even be established in kind, loving kindness. A judge will sit on it in faithfulness in the tent of David. Moreover, he will seek justice. He will be prompt in his righteousness. So it's saying that there's going to be a... Even though Moab is going to be destroyed, yeah. Israel's going to have a, a, a righteous judge sitting on it. Yeah. Now, it's hard to know. It is, can you say that is a, a king they would know? Like, could it be Hezekiah? Mm. Hezekiah was a very good king at, at that mm. time. And if so, could he be a picture of the Messiah that's coming later? Right. So that's that's kind of how I see it. I, I think yeah. that there will be a, a righteous judge on the throne at the time of this destruction of, of Moab, but that later on he's a picture of the Messiah that's coming later. Yeah. So that's kind of how I see that one. Well, when it says be a hiding place, verse 4, um, okay. be a hiding place to them from the destroyer. I yeah. Think the destroyer is... I'm assuming right that's Assyria. Okay. Yeah. That would make a lot of sense, and especially that, that would mean that Hezekiah could be that righteous king that's at that time. And it's possible this is an earlier... Is this the earlier uh, oracle on Moab? Well, this is earlier than the second one, yeah. Yeah. And then it would maybe, I guess, presumably be ahead of yeah. the Assyrian one probably too. Yeah, probably. Uh, it's hard to know yeah. the dates on them, but yeah, yeah, but uh, but it, it would make be, some sense. Sure, it would be Assyria, but there potentially could be Assyria. Yeah, and oh, that's and interesting. It, and, it, and it would seem like to me that the Assyrians haven't been destroyed yet because mm-hmm. they're actually taking over Moab. Yeah. So you could maybe fit some of the history in that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So so that's 
Moab. Now, the next one is actually interesting. Yeah, you mentioned this earlier. Yeah, you thought it would have been Syria. Damascus is a city. Yeah. So, so here you've got uh, um, Damascus, and, and it, the, the thing most unusual about this is it's not called Syria, it's called yeah. Damascus. Yeah. And for a long time, Damascus was the major city of Syria. Hmm. So it was probably a city-state long before it was a country. Interesting. Yeah. And so, all of 17 is about Damascus? Yeah. All of uh, chapter uh, 17? Uh, uh, yes. Um, t- yep. Because uh, uh, 18 got the next one. Okay. All right. Uh, look at 17, uh, verse 1. The oracle concerning Damascus, behold, Damascus is about to be removed from being a city. It will be a fallen ruin. So that's probably all we got to tell you. Yeah, right. <laughs> and now you know yeah. what's going to happen. Yeah. So here it is against Damascus. Now, on our map, you can see where Damascus is above Israel. Now, What's interesting on this one, though, look at verses 4 through 6. Now, in that day, the glory of Jacob will fade, and the fatness of his flesh will become lean. So what day are we talking about? It's the day that Damascus is going to fall, right? When they're going to be punished? Right. So why is Israel going to be punished at the same time? Right. The answer is, during, during the time of Sennacherib, or before that Syro-Ephraimite war, Syria and Israel ganged up on Judah. So I actually think this one might be even an earlier time, or at least referring to an earlier time when when Damascus is going to be punished, but so is Israel because they... They were together together. against Judah. Wow. Okay. It will be even like the reaper gathering standing grain. As his arm harvests the ears, it will also be like uh, gleaning ears of grain in the valley of uh, Rephaim. Rephaim. Yet gleanings will be left. It will be like the shaking of an olive tree, two or three olives on the topmost bow, uh, four or five branches on a fruitful tree. So that's actually, t- that's given us a little hint on how they they gathered fruit. Yeah. My understanding is they'd take the olive tree, wait till it's pretty ripe, and then go and shake it, yeah. and then pick them up off the ground. Yeah. So, But it's yeah. saying that it'll be like having a few olives still left still on that tree. On the, yeah. that, that would be like a remnant. So there's going to be very few people yeah. left. Yeah. Okay? All right. In that day, a man will be will have regard for his maker. Now, my guess is that at that point, some of them will. Mm-hmm. Um, even during Hezekiah's time, as far as we know, some of the people from up north, Israel, came down to be in Judah. Mm-hmm. If, I, if, I was, if I was Israel at that point... I would have fled to Judah, yeah. right? Because they're they're going right. to be deported by the Assyrians if they don't. Yeah. So it's be to their advantage to get out of there if they can. Yeah. So that's probably what's going on there. Um, and his eyes will look to the Holy One of Israel. He will not have regard for the altars or the work of his hands, nor will he look to which his fingers have made. Well, that's you know, even the Asherim and the incense stands. Yeah. So it's basically saying some of them actually will legitimately yeah. turn back to God. Yeah. Okay. All right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, um, oh, verse 14, because I wanted you to see that. Um, At evening time, behold, there is terror. Before morning, they they are no more. Such will be the portion of those who plunder us and the lot of those who pillage us. So who's the? Well, let's go back. At okay. evening time, behold, there uh, there is terror. Before morning, they they are no more. So that means the destruction is going to happen really quick, right? Yeah, Be- so over between quick. evening to to night yeah. or to morning, right? Okay, such will be the portion of those who plunder us. Who do you think the us would be? I would think it's Judah. Yeah, so, or, or yeah, probably because it's it's not going to be Northern Kingdom, yeah, right? Because they're right. in being punished already. Yeah. Yeah. So so it's basically saying, and, and remember, we already saw in chapter 14 where it says, so this is going to be the, the lot for those people who mm-hmm. go against God. Well, now it says, this is probably because these guys have gone against Israel or Judah, and yeah. so they're going to be plundered too. Yeah. And so he's saying that's it's just like what God had said. Yeah. They're going to be plundered, and that's going to be what's going to happen to people that come after us. Yeah. It's over quick. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and it's because they came after Swift. Israel, yeah. right? right? Or Judah. Yeah. So it will make a distinction. So in, yeah. in the book of Isaiah, it's sometimes really hard to know yeah, whether it's yeah. talking about Israel, the northern kingdom, right. Israel, the country, or Judah. You know, it's it's those terms. So you have to look at the context and see if it gives us any clue. This one, um, the us, wouldn't make any sense because it, it, to be uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, right. because it's already told us that Jacob was going to be 
depleted, yeah. its glory is going to be going. Yeah. So yeah. that that helps us to well, see. Well, historically that. too. Yeah. The idea that yeah they're partnered with Syria at this point. Yeah, because they were taken over yeah. and or had deported been at least. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay, so all that makes sense. Yeah. So that's the next oracle. Now we're on the sixth one. And this is against, this is chapter 18. Yeah. Okay. And this is Ethiopia. Uh, we're we're going to learn later. It, it's another name for Cush. So oh, what okay. I did here is I, I gave you a picture of what Cush was. Mm -hmm. So it, as you can see, it's it's below. South of Egypt. Yeah. yeah so it's below. Um, it's like the furthest. Uh, cataracts are, are like where the uh, rocks come through. And so it's like dams almost. Hmm. So it's got, it's got uh, five cataracts in the Nile River. And mm. once you get past about the third one, you're into a different country. Yeah. So almost always that was the case. Um, so, so basically, um, we're down in that area just south of Egypt. And the rivers get mentioned twice in here, which okay. was interesting to me, I okay. thought. So I, I was assuming that was some kind of common descriptor for, for this Ethiopia. Country? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah uh, they pick up the exact same phrases. That's what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. It's, it's in two and then yeah. at the end... Or... Or seven, maybe a powerful and oppressive nation whose land the rivers divide. Oh, yeah, okay. That's now, in two and if you see our picture, um, yeah, or our map, you can see there's something called the Blue Nile and the White Nile, mm. and so that's probably so the Nile's dividing the, the country, okay, yeah. yeah. So I think that's probably what it's getting at. Yeah, I just thought it was interesting that came up twice. Yeah. So I, I just assumed maybe that was some kind of you Hint. know, that's how you call, so yeah, you, how you describe. Ethiopia back then was yeah, you know, probably it's prob the country that the rivers. It was probably easiest that way because yeah. they probably changed names quite regularly, right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just like today. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's look at a couple of these. Let's look at verses one and two. Alas, O land of the whirling wings, which lies beyond the rivers of Cush, which sends envoys by the sea, even the papyrus vessels on the surface of the water, go swift messengers to a nation tall and smooth. Now. Notice it saying, go to them. So my understanding is Israel, is, or Judah at this point, is mm. trying to get help from Ethiopia, mm. okay? Um, they, they say they're... Now, that tall, make, you know what tall is, but smooth would probably mean they didn't have hair on their arms. Like mm. so, and, and that would make sense in, in Egypt and in Ethiopia. It's a hot country, so they, would, they wouldn't have much hair on their mm. arms. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think that's what it's it's talking about. But notice, to a people feared far and wide, a powerful and aggressive and oppressive nation. So that's how they were known even back then. Yeah. So, so that gives you some help. But that's the kind of people they want, right? Yeah. Who you want on your side? Probably. Yeah. But now look at verse four. For thus the Lord has told me, I will look from my dwelling place quietly, like dazzling heat in the sunshine like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. So um, my understanding is that, that, you know how at harvest time it would vapor, um, uh, dew would evaporate really fast. Okay. So I think that the, it's saying that their hope in, um, in Ethiopia to help them is going to be like dew in, yeah. a, in a high climate. It's going to be it's, gone yeah. in no time. Yeah. Okay? So the image is beautiful there. All right? Now let's go to 6 and 7. Okay, they will be left together from uh, the mount. Oh, it's, it talks about them being destroyed. Okay, and then they will be left yeah. together from uh, together for mountain birds of the prey and for the beasts of the earth. And the birds of prey will spend the summer feeding on them, and the beasts of the earth will spend harvest time on them. At that, okay, so basically it's saying they're going to be destroyed, and basically there's going to be so many dead. The animals yeah. are going to be able to eat off them for a long time. That's kind of what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't sure because the yeah. previous verse it uh -huh. refers to harvest and a lot. It seems like a lot of plants. Yes, you know it's it's like yeah. you know um, flower becomes a ripening grape. Cut off the sprigs, pruning knives. There's going to be you know removal of you know branches. Uh -huh. It's all in the now. Let's think about that. Okay, yeah. God's feeding even the birds. So right. basically, in the f the first part, they're harvesting food to feed the people. Yeah. The, later, God's yeah. harvesting these people to feed the birds. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. But I was like, it's pretty dark. Yeah. I yeah. want to make sure that's where I'm, I'm headed. But that's yeah. Yeah, that's it. I think that's a horrible way to go. Yeah. Now look at verse seven though. 
At that time, a gift of homage would, be, homage would be brought to the Lord of hosts from a people tall and smooth, even from people feared far and wide, powerful and oppressive nation. So that sounds like it's the same gonna, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exact same wording. Very specific. But now yeah. they're bringing a yeah. gift of homage to the Lord. Yeah. So at some point, they're going to realize how great this God is, and they're going to offer him gifts. Yeah. So so um, before, what happened is that the um, it, it's saying that the people were going down trying to get. Uh, these people to fight with them properly, yeah. you know, to give them gifts and hopefully they fight. Well, now at some point they're going to want to be joined with Israel. And so my guess is it, it, this still could be talking about 701 because mm. in 701, the, the people of Cush actually did help Israel, but it didn't do any good. Or, mm. or Judah, I mean, did yeah. help Judah, but it didn't do any good. They came up, but they got destroyed really fast. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, Who's, uh, yeah, so land divide the river to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, even Mount Zion. So they're apparently going to accept the the uh, alliance with Israel, or Judah, but it doesn't do any good because yeah. they get wiped out really fast. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. All right. That Now, Ethiopia, there's one even for Judah, or for e Egypt. So uh, Egypt is a separate one from the Ethiopians. Uh, yeah. And that's because during different times in Egypt's history... Different people controlled them, and uh, actually, Cush was one of them. That mm. that during Isaiah's time, would they they would have been controlled by the the people south of them. Egypt would have been controlled uh -huh. by Cush or yeah. Ethiopia. Yeah. Okay. And then, so what's the distinction for it? Potentially, this is a time when when this oracle was written. Potentially, Egypt was own, or is it just a specific? Um, it, it was. Remember, it's a specific country, so it may not necessarily be the same time, but it okay. may be. Um, um, I see. Okay. In 701, they both came together to fight uh, uh, against the Assyrians. Yeah. But it didn't matter because the Assyrians yeah. won anyway. Yeah. So. And Egypt is also a fairly long oracle. Yeah. This is a, this is a little yep. more depth than some of the other ones we've gotten. Yeah. And in fact, what's interesting here is you have an, um, what looks like poetry mm -hmm. and then a narrative explanation of it in, mm. in more detail. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, so what what we'll do is I'll try to get um, the parts that will help us. So, okay. verses one and two first. The oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud, uh, and about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble in his in, in his presence, and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. So they so I will incite the Egyptians. And, and against the Egyptians, and they will fight each against brother against brother, against neighbor, a city against city, and and a, a kingdom against kingdom. Now that's interesting because during Egypt's history, that often happened. Okay, mm -hmm. um, I had a, a student do a dissertation on this section here, and he he had specific times when he thought these were actually being fulfilled mm. in there, and, and he, I think he was probably right. So. Wow. So it fits the time period really well. Yeah. Okay? Now, look at verse 4. Moreover, I will deliver the Egyptians into the hands of a cruel master, and a, and a mighty king will rule over them, uh, declares the Lord of hosts, or Lord God of hosts. Now, I, I've thought that cruel master was the Assyrians, so either uh, Esarhaddon, who comes down and takes it, or even Ashurbanipal. Which takes Egypt, okay. um, but he the the guy that did the dissertation he actually argued that it was one of the Egyptians' own mm. pharaohs that mm. actually was cruel to the the various nations and oh, interesting. and even even cruel to his nation. Yeah, so he might be right. I still think the Assyrians probably fits it better, mm. but and and they were conquered by now. The reason I think it fits it better is because uh, if you remember um, Egypt's. Even though they're Egyptians, they still and they're a cruel master. They still, they'd still be ruled under the Egyptians or you know mm. the Pharaoh or whoever it is. Um, but if you do it by the Assyrians, they take the whole area and they're cruel over the whole region and yeah. not just one part being cruel over another part of it. Yeah. So yeah. I think it fits a little better. Yeah. But all right, let's look in verse sixteen then. In that day, the Egyptians will be like women, and they will tremble and be in dread because of the waving of the hands of the Lord of hosts. And he is now notice because of the waving of the hand. We don't exactly know what that means, but it probably means to you know, like the Romans would say, away with the hmm. thing, like we talked about yeah. earlier. I think it's got something like that to to tell them away with this country. 
Okay. Some kind of dominance. Yeah. And they're gonna it says like like women, so they're they're gonna they're gonna be really afraid and, and in terror and all that. Mm. Okay. Um they were weren't very sexist back then, I guess. They they, they didn't have a problem with, with saying that. All right. The land of Judah will become a tear to Egypt, and everyone in it will mention the dread of it because of the purpose of the Lord of hosts he is proposing against them. So notice this one is in narrative explaining the destruction that's going on. Yeah. So um, I, I wanted you to see, can you look at verse 16? It says, in that day, mm-hmm. then look at verse 18, in that day, Yeah. Uh, 19, in that day, and then 23, in that day. So it's got four oracles. Oh, I think, oh, hang on. 24 as well. Yeah. So there's five oracles explaining what that day is going to be like. Yeah. Okay? So they're going to be in terror was the first one. In that day, five cities of the land of Egypt will be speaking the language of Canaan and swearing allegiance to the Lord of hosts. Uh, one will be called the city of destruction. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, There's a little play on words. It could be the city of the sun there too, but it doesn't matter. It's saying that five cities in the land of Egypt will be have allegiance to God. Yeah. So, so um, I, I, it's hard to know when this is. uh, Some people have thought it's during the time when. um, like in the about the 400 uh elephantine had some jewish people living there mm. and so maybe cities like that would have would have had their allegiance to god mm. or it could be it could be more because uh, if the city of destruction is actually the city of the sun would be helopolis uh, which was one of the capitals at one time in egypt oh, okay. so so it's hard to know exactly what it's getting at but apparently if at some point in his in egypt's history they're going to have Cities and notice it's only only five cities, so that's yeah. that's not a major part of of Egypt, I would yeah. think. But yeah. some part of a remnant is yeah. going to be there. Yeah. Okay. And then verse nineteen: In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar to the Lord in, uh, near its border. So there'll be some kind of an altar. Oops, mm-hmm. did I just move that? I did. Sorry. Um, there's going to be a um, an altar mm-hmm. to the Lord at some point too. And then on the border, that would probably be also, so that would be like usually uh, when you had something like this, uh, a pillar that would mark out God's area. Oh. So that could be what that's getting at, that Egypt is going to have a yeah. part that's dedicated to God. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. see. That was verse 19. Tw- yeah. So here's verse see. 20. It will 20. become a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt that they will cry to the Lord because of oppressors and he will send them a savior and a champion and he will deliver them. Now, once again, that's a kind of a tough thing. Who is that referring to? Right. Some, some have thought the, the, the savior or champion is one of the pharaohs of Egypt that actually took back control of the land and following the Assyrians took back the land from the Assyrians. Mm. So I think that probably makes sense. So they call out to him and God gives them a deliverer for a short time. I don't, uh, once again, I don't think it's the Messiah, but I think it's a, it's one of the deliverers that they had during that historical time. Okay. Okay. All right. Verse 23, in that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And the Assyrians will come into Egypt and the Egyptians into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. That was interesting. Yeah, and that next phrase, I I never knew verses 24 and 25 were in this book for a long time. Mm. But look what it says. In that day, Israel will be a third party with Egypt and Assyria a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of uh, of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed is Egypt my people, and Assyria the work of my hands, and Israel my inheritance. Yeah. That is amazing, isn't it? I wrote that phrase down, Egypt my people. Yeah. That's very fascinating. Yeah. Israel's... Now, I think it's interesting, Israel's my inheritance, so that means the past, that my past connection is with Israel, Yeah, but... Egypt is going to be a work of, of is my people and the work of my hands of Syria. And what do you think work of my hands? I, I am assuming it means uh, like a potter would make a vessel. Mm. So here's uh, uh, Assyria, my my vessel. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it could maybe still fit. I My first thought was maybe it's kind of getting into that image of Assyria as like oh, the rod. It's like a oh. tool to be... Okay. Used maybe, but that that may be too narrow. Then I this. think I think this is saying that one of these days God's going to have 
possession in all of these countries. Huh. Yeah. Wow. Hey, so now remember, these are the oracles to the nations, right? Mm. And the whole purpose for these is to let people know that Yahweh is the God of all nations, mm. the God of the world. So if if this is happening and he's and it's saying, well, one of these days, I'm going to even have a portion, you know, a remnant coming from these areas that yeah. are serving me. I think that would be a, a a good use of these oracles to the nations. Yeah. So so I think that's what that's getting at. And, yeah. And and I think the key is telling us that's not the God of just Israel. He's mm. the God of the world and mm. all. And, and remember, Egypt and Assyria are two of the countries that do serious damage, right, to God's people. And right. he's saying, well, one of these days. I'm going to be controlling them. Yeah. They're going to be a part of my kingdom. Yeah. And notice it doesn't say Babylon. Yeah. So I, th- I think that's given us a little hint that this is earlier than that. Yeah. Because you would thought if, if it was written during the Babylonian time, that they'd mention that. Yeah. But they don't. And I, I think that gives you a little hint on the date of it. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because it also doesn't seem... This seems like a positive. Yeah. It doesn't seem there. like a... a I'll be dominating right. Egypt or Assyria. It yeah. seems more, I don't know how kind to Kind of say. a relationship. Yeah. 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 I think you're right. I th- and I think that's going to, I think that's really talking about the future. I think yeah. there will be a time when yeah. God's controlling all the world and, mm-hmm. and they'll be doing it because they want to serve him. Yeah. And, and, and that, you kind of got that with him making that, that highway that, that mm. goes from Assyria to Egypt and, yeah. and back and forth, and they're right, coming, right. and they're both going to worship God. They're going to be kind of together. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that helps us too. Yeah. Okay. That's right. the seventh oracle. Uh-huh. And now on to chapter 20. Yeah. And this one is is got two parts, or yeah. it's to two people. Yeah. Uh, it looks like it's to Egypt and Ethiopia. Two people we've already read about. Yes. Or two countries we've already read and, about. And notice, once again, it's a small one. Yeah. And this one is really specific. I don't know if you noticed, um, but it's talking about a specific time when Ashdod uh, gets captured by Sargon, it sounds like. Mm. Um, Now, make sure... Well, let's read it first. In the year that the commander came to Ashdod, then Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him, and he he, um, fought against Ashdod and captured it. So, so... Sargon is is one of the Assyrian kings, okay? Sargon II, um, about the seven seven oh five somewhere in there is I think when he died, okay? So so it's saying that Sargon and his commander is going to go to Ashdod, which are the Philistines, right? Okay. To, okay. So I don't know if we remember that picture, but um, the map where Ashdod was one of the major parts of Assyria, mm. okay? Or, I'm sorry, of the Philistines. Yeah, it's one so of the that, five cities. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's the Assyrians coming there. Okay. At that time, the Lord spoke through Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go and loosen the sackcloth from your hips and take your shoes off your feet. And he did so. And he said, Go around, uh, um, and he did so, uh, going naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, Even as my servant Isaiah has gone naked and barefoot for three years as a sign and token against Egypt and Cush, so the king of Assyria will lead you away, captives of Egypt and the exiles of Cush. Young and old, naked and barefoot, with buttocks uncovered, to the shame of Egypt. So, so basically, it's saying, at some point, Assyria is going to going to win a battle mm. um, where the Egyptians came up, and at Ashdod, that battle is going to happen. Well, my guess is that's seven hundred one, because mm. or the events right shortly before it, because um, that's what happened. Um, Sargon actually died in seven hundred five, I believe it was, but then uh, his son Sennacherib took yeah. over, and so Sennacherib's going to be coming in and finishing the job that I, that right. Sargon started. Right. Okay. Poor Isaiah. Wouldn't you have to for three years three having to walk around years. naked? Yeah. But imagine. It, it, I think sometimes God has to get people's attention. Yeah. And I think this is he's trying he's trying to help these people. Mm. You know, here's Egypt and, and Ethiopia. God could have said, you know what? I don't care about you. I'm not gonna help you. Well instead, he sends Isaiah to even send a message to them yeah. that that they better that if you go against the Assyrians, you're gonna lose. Yeah. And in in that for three years Isaiah was letting them know that. Yeah. I just think it's interesting that God cares so much about even nations that you would have thought he wouldn't care about. Right. So but he does. Right. So that's yeah. that's what this one's about. Yeah. That was an interesting one. Yeah. 
That was very. That, it, it is different from and, the others, and it's right very specific because it. because yeah. I think it's talking about a very specific time period, and it tells you it's the time when Sargon and and Sennacherib were coming together. It doesn't actually mention um, Sennacherib, but yeah. Sargon was the one that died, and his son took over. Yeah. So that gives you some clue of what time it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and now our next one. Okay. Chapter twenty one. Are you back into Babylon? <laughs> I think so. Although, notice it's really, ha- it doesn't tell us this one. Yeah. Um, there's going to be two of them that are like that. Yeah. Kind uh, of the vague. other one is that yeah. Valley of Vision. Yeah. You know, so, th- so you've got two at the end here where that their titles are a little uncertain about what's going on, but yeah. it, it gets clear later on. Yeah. Okay, look at, look at verse 1. The oracle concerning the wilderness of the sea. As windstorms on the Negev swept swept up and it comes from the wilderness and a terrifying land, a harsh vision has been shown to me. The treacherous one still deals treacherously and the destroyer still destroys. Go up, Elam, lay siege, uh, media. Uh, Mm. Let me just, uh, I don't know, have you guys, have you ever seen a dust devil? I don't think I've seen one in person. Look look what that first verse says. As uh, wind st- uh, storms in the Negev sweep on, it comes from the wilderness and terrifying land. I think that's what talking about a, a, a dust devil, one of, the, mm. one of those that the, the, it's almost like a tornado that whips up the... It's a lot smaller, but it whips up this dust and yeah. it's coming across. And I think because uh, Negev is such a dry land, I think that's probably what it's getting at. These And it's saying that Babylon is going to be destroyed... Um, and it calls it the wilderness of the sea. Remember, Babylon, uh, its end was down by the sea, mm. um, the corner of the sea. So so it would fit that area really well. And I think that's why it's called um, uh, yeah, the wilderness of the sea rather than just come right out and say it's Babylon. But it gets real clear that it is Babylon. Uh, it t- was talking about those um, horse riders coming and stuff. But look at verse 9 says very clearly, fallen, fallen is Babylon. Right. And their images are laying on the ground. Yeah. They're gods. Yeah. So it makes it real clear this is a destruction of Babylon. And we, we learned from those two cities, those countries before too, Elam and uh Oh, and verse media. two, Elam and yeah. Media. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's this one. Um, this is Babylon has fallen and it's been destroyed. Okay. So you're right. This one actually is coming back to... Um, right, you know, right at the beginning, we had that one about Babylon, right. and now it's. Been, I'm not sure why it's got a separate one, unless mm-hmm. this is a a later time. Um, you know, um, the, the earlier one didn't actually mention that they were going to. You know, it talked about the um, um, nations are being raised up, mm-hmm. to, you know, like the from Sheol and stuff. But this oh, one, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. this one makes it real clear that who's going to do it, Elam and Media. Yeah. So, so maybe it just needed a little more clarity, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. Anyway, okay, that's number nine. Now I've got two shorties, two little short ones. Yeah, we do. So one is Edom, um, which we hadn't... Remember, we had Moab before, not oh, yeah. Edom. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Edom okay. is basically south, yeah. south of Moab. Yeah. And now, once again, it's really short. Um, uh, this one's two verses. <laughs> yeah. All right. The oracle concerning Edom. Uh, one keeps calling me from Seir. Seir is another... Um, oh, I thought I had it up here. Seir is an- another region in uh, Moab. Okay. All right. Watchman, how far is the night? Watchman, how far is the night? Remember repeating it for mm-hmm. emphasis or for speed. The watchman says, morning comes, but also night. So when it says morning comes, but also night, it would mean... Well, there was a, a little rest, uh, some mm-hmm. kind of a break, but then more is coming. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you would inquire, inquire, come back, uh, come back again. So I, I guess what it's saying is there, there's more coming, and if you want to know more about it, it'll will tell you more about the destruction that's coming. There, mm. There's going to probably be another one. So, so I think what this is getting at is that Moab is going to be taken several times, and so um, there's a. Uh, coming, and it's going to get easier for them, and then it's going to come again. And so I think it's just multiple uh, Wait, you said destructions. Moab. Edom? Do you I'm mean sorry, Edom, will... Edom, I meant. Okay, I see, yeah, I see. Sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a quick one. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And not so good either, uh, you know, that it's going to have multiple times yeah. it's going to get punished. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting just how short it is, I think. Yeah. Um, 
And um, a lot of, once again, Edom uh, was part of the nation of Israel, you know, because mm. they're related yeah, nation, yeah. actually. So it's interesting that now you've got a little small one against it, too. Yeah. All right, now uh, Arabia. And uh, I, I thought what might be uh, going in this, is, okay, so it starts in verse 13. The oracle about Arabia, in the thickets of Arabia, you must spend the night. What's that? Well, let's keep going. Uh, o caravans of Dedanites, bring water for the thirsty inhabitants of the land of Tima, meet the fugitive with bread. Okay, look, look, look if you look, there's, there's Dina, Dedan. Mm -hmm. um, I thought we had even um, uh, Tima on here. I, don't, I guess I don't, but Tima is in just a little ways from Dedan there, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so when it says, uh, bring water for the thirsty and inhabitants of Tima, and oh, inhabitants of Tima, and bring a fugit uh, fugitive bread, which means, so so Arabia is really dry, so they're going to the, um, Tima and Dedan would be uh, major cities around the the um, springs of water. Oh, okay. So so when the, fugi the those that are fleeing <clears throat> go through there, they're to help them out, okay? So it, once again, it doesn't tell exactly when it is, but it does say that you're supposed to help these people when they come through. Yeah. All right? Now, for they have fled from the swords, from the drawn sword, and from the bent bow, from the press of battle. So that lets you know these are fugitives fleeing from some battle. Yeah. Okay. Okay. For thus says the Lord to to me, in a year, as a hired man would count it. Um, I always like that. You know, the, the last time yeah, it was three years as a hired yeah. person. So that actually lets you know this is this is almost to the day. Because if I if I was a hired man, I'm going to want to know exactly how yeah. much I'm going to have to you know yeah. work to be for this hire. Yeah. And so, so I think that's what it's getting at. It's going to be a specific, really close yeah. time. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, uh, and all the splendor of T uh, Kedar will terminate, and the remnant of the number of bowmen and the mighty men of the sons of Kedar will be few. And the Lord of, of Israel and the Lord God of Israel has spoken. So Kedar was I, I should have found a better one that had these, but Kedar is another city, um, and apparently um, it was probably one of them that was pretty important because it it's got a whole verse talking about how it's going to be destroyed and all its people destroyed with it. Mm, yeah. Okay. Now, look how it ends. Um, uh, the mighty men and the sons of Kedar will be few, for the Lord God of Israel has spoken. So that's just confirming to make sure. Now, that's kind of, uh, if you see it, that's, that's almost all the oracles to the nations. Chapter 22 is actually to Judah again. Oh. Okay, we, we're going to look at it. It's to Judah again. So, so right at the end of all these other nations, you've got that that the Lord God has spoken this. Mm. So it's true and it's yeah. going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? All right, 22, the Valley of Vision. This one is actually kind of interesting. Oh, I better go to the next one. This one's kind of interesting because it's divided in about half the section. Um, the first one is um, like one through seven, and it's talking about the events around the to the end of the of Judah. So about five eighty six, it's okay. talking about. But then uh, verses eight through fourteen seem to be talking about verse uh, more about the time around seven oh one. So there are two different times, but both times Israel is is pretty much destroyed, mm. okay, or almost destroyed. 701, yeah. God steps in and stops it, yeah. but in 586, he doesn't, and yeah. they get sent off to Babylon. Right, Okay. Right. Now, I'll show you in a minute. So let's look at the passage, and we're going to have to do this in pretty good detail, because it'll help us to see what's going on, okay? All right, the, uh, starts in verse 1. The oracle concerning the valley of vision. What is the matter with you now that you have gone up to the housetops? You who are full of noise, you boisterous towns, you exultant city. You're slain or not slain with the sword, nor did they die in battle. Okay, let me just stop there to make sure we understand. So it sounds like there's a tumult outside the, the wall. And so the people are up on the top of this, uh, their houses to see what's going on out there. Mm. Well, what's going on if this is actually 586? It's the Babylonians are out there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, how I got that was look at verse three. Your rulers have fled together. They have been captured without a bow. All of you who were taken, um, were, were found, were taken captive together, though they fled far away. Now, do you, I don't know if you remember, but the, at the end of um, the the Babylonian time period, when the when Zedekiah knew 
that they'd already taken, they'd already captured the outside city, or I mean, sorry, the outside wall, they'd broken it down mm. and they were heading to, to get the next one. Um, in Jerusalem, um, this is also going to be another little thing that Hebrew will help you. Um, Jerusalem is it got a dual ending on it. That means there's two parts of Jerusalem. One was the the wall around the the uh, the palace and the where the king would be. Okay. The other was the outside wall. Yeah. So you had the um, part of it would be the uh, lower city and then the upper mm. city. Yeah. Um, but the lower city has now already been destroyed. Okay. And they're heading up to get the king in yeah. the upper city. And um, that's when Zedekiah flees. He takes his, his, some of his men with him and some of the royal people, and they fled. Um, and so when it says, um, your rulers have fled together, they have been captured without the bow. Um, all of you, uh, all of those were found were taken together captive, uh, though they had fled far away. So actually, basically what happened, um, they were actually fleeing because they wanted to try, because they knew the Babylonians were coming. Yeah. So they thought rather than just get sacrificed, they might as well flee. So they actually fled outside. It says they go by the valley gate, which would have been down uh, along. Actually, this is probably not real clear because um, this, is, this is all of Jerusalem at, a, at mm. Jesus's time. Um, it, that all wouldn't have been there during um, uh, okay. Hezekiah's time. time. Yeah. yeah, so they they actually flee out there and then try to try to uh, get away, and they don't. Yeah. So that's that's where Babylon they captured them. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's that's talking about the events. Um, for the Lord God of hosts has a day of panic, subjugation, and confusion in the Valley of Vision. So that's where the title comes in. Mm -hmm. So it's just a day of them being destroyed in the Valley of Vision, okay? Um, breaking down the walls and crying to the mountains, Elam took up the quiver against the chariots and infantry and horsemen, and Kerr uncovered the shield. Once again, you saw that name, Elam. Elam was that country that uh, yeah. Persians had had used. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, my guess is when the Babylonians took over Israel, though, they probably hired mercenaries from Elam too. Mm. So that's probably where this is coming from. Elam took up quiver and and Kerr uncovered the shield. So what that probably means is they had mercenaries from that area. Yeah. Okay. Um, then your choices valleys were full of chariots, and the horsemen took up fixed positions at the gate. So. To verse seven, there, all of that seems to be talking about the uh, 586 when when the Babylonians took Israel and took took them captivity and and took them off to Babylon. Yeah. Okay. And and so it helps us to know. Uh, it's that's why it's called the Valley of Vision. I think it's because it's it's future time for them, mm. but they know they're going to be destroyed. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now let's look at verse eight. And he removed the defenses of Judah. In that day, you depended on the weapons of the house of the forest. You saw that the breaches in the wall of the city of David were many, and you collected the waters of the lower pool. Well, that doesn't that doesn't fit what happened in 586. Um, what it's talking about there um, in in 701, Hezekiah built up um, the what's called the broad wall today. If you go to Jerusalem, you can actually see the broad mm. wall, wow. um, and and they've un, they've excavated it, and they can see that Hezekiah, when Sennacherib came in 701, built up that northern wall, and they also dug what's called Hezekiah's tunnel. Um, so, so that didn't happen in 586, but it's another time when when God's people were in battle, and and I, so I think it's it's putting two of um, two of the time periods together, and they're out of chronological order. The first yeah. one is when um, Sinek, or I mean um, Zedekiah and his men fled, and then now this is talking about when um, Hezekiah um, built that broad wall when Sennacherib came in seven hundred one. Okay, yeah. it's going to get even clearer, but I, but it's interesting. It's talking about two different time periods. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then you okay. So it just told you in verse nine um, uh, what was going to happen. Now in verses ten and eleven make it even more detailed. Um, you counted the houses of Jerusalem. You tore down the house, houses to fortify the wall. Well, it just said in verse nine that you saw the breaches uh, in the wall of the city were many. So uh, here's what are they going to do to fix that? Well, they're mm. going to tear down the walls to build up that, or the city, or the uh, the houses, houses to yeah, to the build wall. up that yeah, yeah. wall. 
Okay, and he made a reservoir between the two walls for the uh, the waters of the old pool. The old pool is the pool of Siloam. So in Hezekiah's tunnel is is basically dug through the. In fact, it is a picture of it there. Mm. It starts at the Gihon Springs. I don't okay. know if you can see it there. Yeah. It goes then down through it and it comes out at the pool of Siloam. Right. It's. I think it's about a third of a mile long. Oh, wow. Yeah. Underground. Wow. Yeah. But if you what they it, it's a Necker's time. What they wanted to do is they wanted to make sure Hezekiah had water inside the city and that the Assyrians didn't have water. Right. So it made sense to then cover up the 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 opening to the Gihon Springs. Yeah. And then get Read water on the inside of the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If wow. if you ever get a chance, look up on the internet about Hezekiah's tunnel. It's it's got some great pictures to oh, help okay. you to see it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but you did not depend on him and made it. Well, who's the him who made it? Who made the uh, the 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 water and the Gihon Springs and stuff like that? Be God, right? Yeah. So Hezekiah was thinking about how do I deliver Jerusalem with a, apart and I don't, from God? Yeah, I don't know that it is necessary. He just wasn't considering God. Yeah. You know, because because at that point they they had to see if they could do it on their own. Mm. Well, they found out they couldn't, and they yeah. needed God's help. Yeah. In fact, uh, we're going to see that later when we get to chapters uh, 36 through 37. It's really clear what happens, and, and you know, they call on God for help, hmm. finally. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but you, you did not depend on him who made it, nor did you take into consideration him who planned it long ago. Mm. So this was God's plan from long ago, and they, they didn't even consider calling on God for help. Yeah. Okay? All right, does all that make sense? I think so, yeah. Okay, look at verse 12 now. Therefore, in that day, the Lord of hosts called you to weeping and wailing. Oh, wait, let's find out what day are we talking about? The day of 701 when they were, um, mm. you know, when he, they, he had just said that they, they didn't even consider, um, you know, you didn't th consider yeah. him who made it and stuff yeah. like that. So in that day, 701, um, the Lord of hosts called you to weeping and wailing, to shaving mm -hmm. heads and wearing sackcloth. So what would that mean? Mourning, right? right. He's called them to mourn. And, and you would think that in 701, if God saved you, that you would, you would actually call out to him and thank him and stuff like that. Well, yeah. that's, not that's not what, what happened. happened. Yeah, look what it says. Instead, there's gaiety and gladness, killing of cattle, slattering of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine, saying, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we may die. Wow. So instead of instead of praising God yeah. for just saving your life, I mean, think about it. You've got the Assyrians outside. You know the Assyrians are an extremely dangerous foe. Yeah. And you're inside partying saying, well, who knows? We we made it today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We don't know if we'll make we, it tomorrow. It might not make so. it tomorrow. Yeah. So that's like blowing God off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So look what he says. But the Lord of hosts revealed himself to me. Uh Surely this iniquity will not be forgiven until you die, says the Lord of hosts. So I call this the unpardonable sin of the Old Testament. Mm. Do you know what the unpardonable sin of the New Testament is? It's blaspheming yeah. the Spirit, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you understand what that is? I've understood it to mean kind of a rejection of, a rejection of God. Okay. L let's go to it. Go to Matthew chapter 12. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'll start at verse 22. Okay, I'm okay. there. So uh, Matthew 12, 22. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus, and he healed him so that the mute man spoke and saw. And all the crowds were amazed, saying, This man cannot be the son of David, can he? Um, that's written in such a way to say, Yes, he is. <laughs> so, so they're thinking he's the son of David. Who's the son of David? Well, that's the Messiah, right? Mm. So they're saying, this guy can't be the Messiah, can he? And they think, yes, he is. Yeah. But when the Pharisees uh, heard this, they said, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. They didn't want people to think that Jesus was the Messiah, right? So they'll right. do everything they can to get out of it. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself shall not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How shall his kingdom stand? Well, that's pretty logical, right? Yeah. He's, he's saying Satan's not going to cast out his own people. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. So, so his first argument is 
this doesn't make sense. Why would you even think that this was Satan cast, you know, Beelzebub casting them out? Yeah. Okay. If I by Beelzebub cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? See, they claim that they had Jewish exorcists that could mm -hmm. cast out demons, and if so, who do they cast them out by? Yeah. Beelzebub too? Right. See, that's, that's the implication, right? Yeah. Okay, for this reason, they will be your judges. So basically, you just told them two really good reasons why it can't be Satan casts out Satan. Yeah. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or can you, uh, for, or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the, the hand, binds the strong man and then he can plunder his house? Hmm. So he's basically saying that if I'm doing this by the power of God, then that means the kingdom of God's coming upon you, and that means that Satan is being defeated because mm -hmm. you can't because you can't take his stuff away from him unless yeah, he yeah. first gets bound. Yeah. So does that make sense? So he's yeah, basically yeah, yeah. saying. This is this is a no brainer, you guys, and and, and you better think about it because if this is the kingdom of God coming upon him, upon you, you guys better get with this, or yeah. you're you're going to be fighting against God. Yeah. All right. Now look at verse thirteen or thirty. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. Now that's really... That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Now let's see if I can explain it to you, what I yeah. think it means. Yeah. You could see what Jesus was doing. In fact, they were actually watching Jesus do these miracles, right? Because mm -hmm. you remember the blue, the the blind man and the the, the guy was blind and deaf, oh, yeah. or um, mute yeah. and deaf, and um, and he so and he says um, um, so that so you know so you can say stuff against me. So I'm the Son of Man was Jesus. So he's saying if. If I cast or if I'm um, um, doing these things and and you can speak against me because you don't know for sure that it's God or me doing it, I'll give you that. Okay, um, it will be forgiven you. Okay, so you can say that Jesus is doing it by Satan, and that can be forgiven you. But look at here. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him. So my understanding is that when the Spirit of God comes inside of you and you know that this is of God, mm. and then you blaspheme it and say that that's of the devil, mm. that won't be forgiven. Well, now that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Because you don't want it forgiven, right? right. If, if this is a... It, 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 I, I'd say maybe it sounds like your conscience. Your conscience inside mm. of you says, this is of God. And if you reject that... Then you've and and it, I think you have to go one more step. I think you have to blaspheme and say that that's of the devil. That yeah. would be blaspheming, right? Yeah. Then the only thing that could save you, that meaning uh, that inside spirit that's that's helping you to know this is of God. If you blaspheme that and say no, that's of the devil. The only thing that could help you know the truth, you just blasphemed. You just said mm. I don't want to know that. That's of the devil. Yeah. So you've rejected the anything, the only thing that could have helped you. Yeah. Does that make sense? So, yeah. so here's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Is I understand it's an internal witness that when the Holy Spirit comes inside you and helps you to know something's true, and you blaspheme that, yeah. then there's no no help for you because you just blaspheme the only thing that could have helped you. Yeah. So does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think I think that's what he's saying here, and so that's so it's a clear rejection of. Of, of inside God telling you that this is true and you're rejecting it. Yeah. Now, let's put that okay. back in the Old Testament. Okay. These guys knew very clearly that God had delivered them, right? I mean, he had he had yeah, just right. he had just wiped out the Assyrians in 701 and they're going, "Oh, eh, let's eat and drink for tomorrow we may die." So he's he's saying, "You just you just knew clearly well that I had delivered you and you blew me off. Yeah. You rejected that very knowledge." So I'm going to argue that that is the unpardonable sin of the Old Testament, which is very similar to the uh, blasphemy of the, new, uh, of the Spirit in the New Testament, yeah. is rejecting clear knowledge that you know is true, and you blow it off and argue that it's of the devil. Yeah. So I think this makes a lot of sense then. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty rough. Yeah. I mean, but it's 
it's kind of fair too, yeah. really. You know, everybody always wants to know if you've committed the unpardonable sin. Right. Most people will say, if you if you're even worried about that, then you're pretty sure you haven't committed it. Yeah. Well, that is logical too, because do you see what the Pharisees were doing? The Pharisees knew he was Jesus and that he was the Son of God and he was doing these things by the power of God. And if they didn't totally knew that, they were really close to knowing that and still yeah. rejecting it. Yeah. But instead of saying, yeah, that's of the power of God, they're saying it's of the devil, of yeah. Beelzebub. Yeah. So it, it seems like to me these, these guys in the Old Testament are real close to doing what the Pharisees were doing. Right. So that's why I call it the unpardonable sin yeah. of the Old Testament. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, we're almost done, but we've got one more section, and this one's inter- interesting. So what I tried to do, is it's got basically three parts to it. It's got um, the events around uh, 586, uh-huh. 1 through 7, then the events around 701, mm-hmm. 8, uh, 8 through 14, and then that unpardonable sin, that, that was actually verse 14. Yeah. Okay. Then it talks about Shebna. Shebna is the ruler of the house, it says. So he must be one of the key people controlling it. And it says that um, it, it says he's in charge of the royal household. That, that oh, I see. It's very explicit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So basically, uh, what was happening is he was one of them that was controlling what was going on in the in the kingdom. And apparently, he built a tomb for himself up in the uh, it says up in the cleft. Mm-hmm. So apparently, in a prominent place. And God says. You're a servant of mine. You're not supposed to be doing stuff. Your your job is to control my kingdom. It's not to be building these yeah. big monuments to yourself. Yeah. And so he basically says, I'm going to take you out of there and throw throw you into captivity, be <laughs> Babylon, and I'm going to put a new king in your place. And he put the new one is is in verse twenty. Then it will come about in that day that I will summon my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with a turn the tunic and tie your sash securely about him. I will entrust him with your authority, and he will become a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. So so basically, Shebna went beyond what he was supposed to do, and God has a little oracle right yeah. against him. Yeah. In the midst of the oracles to the nations, <laughs> it's his own people. So that was, I think, is one of the interesting things. In the midst of the oracles to the nations, yeah. you've got one specific, against Judah even, yeah. and then one against the king, you know, the 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 ruler of the house or the royal household, yeah. and he gets nailed too. Yeah. So which it, yeah. I feel like we need to talk about verse seventeen and eighteen because that's just okay. great. Okay. Behold, the Lord is about to <laughs> hurl you headlong, oh man. Yeah. And he's about to grasp you firmly and roll you <laughs> tightly like a ball. The, the, the Hebrew is really interesting there, yeah. uh, 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 of rolling him like a ball. It's yeah. it's it's balling you up like a ball. It's, it's yeah. using the same words to kind of highlight it. Yeah. And then he's going to throw him off into yeah. Babylon. Yeah. You're not coming back from that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, now let's now let's look at what it says about uh, Eliakim. Verse 22, Then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulders, and he will open... Uh, what he opens, no one will shut, and what he shuts, no one will open. Mm. I will drive him like a peg in a firm place, and he will become a, a, a throne of glory in his father's house. So he's going to do his job really well. Yeah. Okay? But now look at the verse 24. So they will hang on him all the glory of the house uh, <clears throat> of his father's house, uh, the offspring and issue, all the ve- um, the least of vessels from the bowls to the jars. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, the peg driven in the wall in a firm place will be give way, and it will even break off and fall, and the load hanging on it will be cut off, for the Lord has spoken. Hmm. So that's saying that even Eliakim, he's doing his yeah. job but he won't be able to hold the country together. It's yeah. going to be taken off, and, and he's going to go to Babylon. Okay. So that's what it yeah. means. He's going to yeah. j- jerk it out of the wall yeah. and send him off into Babylon. Yeah. So basically it's saying even, even though there was probably some people doing a good job, the vast majority have gone way beyond mm. what God ever intended in it, and they've rebelled so bad yeah. that they're going to be punished. Wow. Yeah. So that's kind of how the oracles to the nations ends. And notice it ends with the Lord has spoken. So right. now you've got the this is this is really true. Yeah. You gotta believe it. Yeah. So what do you think? 
pretty intense. Yeah. That was a lot. We covered a lot of ground today, though. And, and basically, it's now these nine or ten, I don't remember how many, uh, we've got these various nations that, uh, actually, I guess it's 12, okay, because uh, one of them is even Judah. Yeah, uh, remember. So uh, you've got these various nations. They've done stuff against God, and they're going to be punished for it. Even got Judah that's going to be punished for it because they've uh, wandered away from God. And then it ends with Shebna, who's the the royal household, the one that controls that, and he's wandered away from God. So God punishes him, mm. and it says you're going to be cast off into into captivity. And that's basically how it ends. And even though Eliakim is a pretty godly guy, apparently. Yeah. Uh, he can't hold the nation together. Yeah. It, it's gone too far. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, what do you think? It was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot, but it's. I think it's. Uh, uh, I mean, on, on a on a higher level, I think it's fascinating to kind of see how Israel, or maybe Judah, more specifically, yeah. in a lot of these cases, is even relating to their neighbors and yeah. all the countries they have all this history with. Yeah. And how God's controlling. Yeah, all that and really driving it forward, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. It was very good. It so very good. And what we'll see is remember that I made it real clear about Assyria being kind mm. of like the key oracle. Yeah. When we get to the second, uh, the back part of the palestrophe, we'll see how uh, God, what God did to uh, Assyria and, and the punishment that He gave them. Okay. So and see how that fits together. Then. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, how much. How are we going to reach the end of the, I the think, palestrophe? I think next time we'll talk about the little apocalypse. Okay. Okay. And then we'll probably even get in. So the little apocalypse has got some real fascinating things in it. Um, and even some things that are in the book of Revelation it talks about. So we'll, I'll try to point those out for you. Okay. And then uh, we might even be able to get into these the, in that middle part of the palestrophe that has the um, the judgment oracle and then yeah. a restoration and then a judgment and a restoration. Um, I think it was eight times going back and uh -huh. forth. So we'll see that next time. Okay. And how far should we read to um, get into that? Is that into like 28, 29? Somewhere yeah. Around there? Yeah. So why don't we, yeah. So why don't we uh, do our best? If we, you know what? If we can get through the little apocalypse and even into a part of the um, the middle of that palestrophe, that would be good. Okay. Okay. So why don't we read to 30? That to 30. Makes sense. Okay. We'll read to 30. All right. Very good. Hopefully, this isn't too jarring. For our listeners, we made a mistake. We left an entire oracle to a specific nation out. So we're coming back a few days later to finish up this episode, possibly the longest episode we've recorded to date. We thought, why not tack on a few more minutes? What did we forget? We forgot the oracle to Tyre. We forgot. We forgot about Tyre. That's chapter For, 23. A very important one, too, because Tyre was so important to to the nations at that time. It's a bad one to miss. Yeah, We sorry. covered a lot last time. <laughs> uh, too much, I guess. And uh, we're just... But I guess we'll just keep adding to it. Yeah. We'll just keep piling on. Let's go to the, the PowerPoint on okay, this one, yeah. because the picture actually helps us a lot. Yeah. For... Um, Probably 400 years, starting at the um, the Assyrian Empire, no one was able. They were all able to conquer the land side, you know, the the old Tyre. Okay. They were not able to conquer the island, and so for like 400 years, country after country tried to destroy the island of Tyre and couldn't, mm. until Alexander the Great came. And what he did is he took the destruction from old Tyre, that rubble and stuff, put it in the ocean all the way out to the city of Tyre, or the like island bridge, of Tyre. like a land yeah. bridge to get over. Yeah, and made it so, it so it went all the way out to it and then conquered it. What a feat. Yeah, <laughs> he was an amazing <laughs> That's man. That's amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> now, why it's so important is because Tyre was so important to the that whole region, the Mesopotamian region, or I'm um, sorry, the Mediterranean region, mm. because they they would they would trade with Tyre. They would, I'm um, sorry, they would trade with Egypt. They would trade with the Greece Empire. They would trade with uh, Tarshish. Remember uh, Jonah flees to Tarshish? Yeah, I saw Tarshish a few times in here, yeah. and I was wondering why. Yeah. Why? Because it's not, it's not part of Tyre itself, but yeah. it's part of the merchant 
uh, sailing um, yeah. routes that they went to. Yeah. And it was probably the furthest one away. It was probably mm. the end. For them, it was like the end of the world. You know, they were at the, the it was yeah. um, probably over by the Cape Hope in, in uh, um, oh, um, okay. on Portugal side there yeah. probably. And and it was something. So so basically what this, this uh, oracle is about is telling us that Tyre is going to be destroyed and, and all these People are weeping, like Tarshish is weeping, and it, the 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 oh, ships of Tarshish. Remember, because those yeah. ones would have now meant yeah, that there's a, there's no one to trade yeah, with this anymore. This is a significant economic yes. disruption. Yep. Um, if you look at uh, another one, um, report to them from the land of Cyprus. So Cyprus would have been another one mm -hmm. that was really hard hit. Um, and then uh, be silent, you inhabitants of the coastland, you merchants of Sidon, your mer um, your messengers cross the sea. So so Sidon was actually closer to, it was in the uh, Lebanon area, mm. so it was closer to her. Um, but one of them laments that Sidon wasn't able to take anywhere near the merchant and stuff like Tyre had. Yeah. Um, it, it laments that they couldn't um, multiply their uh, success. Mm. In Tyre, yeah, or I mean, sorry, in Sidon. Um, so that's the first thing. It's talking about it falling, and then um, in verses eight and nine, it talks. It says, "Let me just read this. Who has planned this against Tyre, the bestower of crowns, whose merchants were princesses, whose traders were the honored of the earth? The Lord of Hosts has planned it to defile the pride of all the beauty, to despise all the honored of the earth." So it sounds like what he's doing is he's remember back in chapter three where it said those who would be lifted high he was going to bring down. Right. Well, this is one of them. So he's he's saying that Tyre had gotten to such an extent in their pride and their arrogance and stuff like that that he wanted to bring them down, mm. and so he does. Yeah. And then okay, so who has planned it? The Lord. And then what's interesting about this one is it says that Tyre after it's going to be destroyed, and I'm assuming that's talking about Alexander that's going to wipe it out. It says that after 70 years, let me, let me go ahead and read it. Now, in that day, Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years like the days of one king. Now, notice, remember the, the uh, Israeli captive, you know, when Israel got captive mm. and taken off to Babylon? Yeah. Remember it was for 70 years too? Right. So it's, it's a similar kind of thing. Now, this one likens it to the days of one king. So like the idea of the authority of a king being for 70 years. Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of, it's interesting. They don't say um, like God destroyed Babylon or God um, sent Israel to Babylon uh, for 70 years. They liken it to the, the time period of a king, huh. okay? Um, at the end of 70 years, it will happen to Tyre as in the song of the harlot. Take up your harp, walk about the city, <clears throat> oh, forgotten harlot, pluck the strings skillfully, sing many songs that they may be, that you may be remembered. So at the end of 70 years, the Lord will visit Tyre. Then she will go back to her harlot's wages and will play harlot with all the kingdoms on the face of the earth. Her gain and her harlot's wages will be set apart to the Lord, and it will not be stored up or hoarded, but her gain will become uh, sufficient food and choice attire for those who dwell in the presence of the Lord. Hmm. So something it's, it says that unlike in the past, she was using all that money for herself. Yeah. Now that money is going to be used for God's people. Wow. It might have something to do with, remember, um, uh, Tyre was one of the people that supplied a lot of the food and the, um, um, sh um, uh, you know, like, like the um, wood and stuff like that okay. for the temple I, or the stones for a temple. Oh. I don't know if you remember that, but that might be what it's getting at, that at some point it's going to be supplying God's people again, huh. or it might be likening it to that time when it liken, uh, it was supplying it before. Interesting. So that might be what's going on here. Yeah. But what's interesting, it's almost like a climax, because Tyre was like the epitome of the nations against God. They were doing their own thing. They were, they were, it talks about their princes as being like kings because yeah. they were so honored. Well, now God's going to bring them down. It's like the, the epitome when, the, when Tyre is like the hugest thing and God destroys it. Well, now we're going to go in soon, very soon into the little apocalypse, which is in chapter 24. Uh -huh. So we've got quite an interesting uh, buildup right before of God destroying kings and nations and yeah. stuff like that. But now we're going to go into the destruction of the whole world. Wow. 
So that's that's kind of where we're going anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm excited to get there. This was good. I'm glad we were able to cover Tyre and get it added into the Oracles of the Nations. Make sure, once again, everyone who's listening, join us next time, and we're going to get into the little apocalypse. Okay. Okay, Thank sounds you. good. Thank you.